Akuna Matata. The phrase sticks with one of my two favorite characters from the Lion King movie. The characters are moved and the expressions are done by these magic wizards. You guessed it, animators. Animators play a quite essential role in all kind of CG industry to move everything around. I have Sean Carlos, who has been in the industry for more than 5 years as an animator. He is an animation course for more than 7 years and a lot of passion towards animation. Let us learn the basics of animations. It's going to be a lot of fun and informative. Let's get started. Thank you for having me and nice to see everyone here. I hope this small session this short session can be useful for you know for anyone even even if you don't want to be like exactly an animator or you're not sure maybe this will inspire you or maybe this will you know open up your eyes a little bit or you know i i i hope it's really really helpful to to you guys so yeah um let's 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 do it let's start <laughs> and i also uh, um i'm going to talk Uh, a little bit about my my duties as an animator first so you guys can understand better like what we do um basically we are the uh, equivalent of the actors and actresses of any live action movie right i started working on t on tv shows when i uh, when i was doing like full character animation and then eventually i moved into the uh, film industry uh but at the end it's basically the same because we got to make sure that uh the characters feel alive i know maybe you guys have heard of this before and honestly it took me a, a, a very long time to to actually understand what they meant when they said to make the characters feel alive so one of the most challenging things about being an animator is it doesn't matter if you're doing like a very cartoony style or if you're doing a TV show or if you are doing a full length feature film or whatever you're doing it doesn't matter as long as you know there is one character in that particular project you're working on you got to make sure that these characters feel authentic and this is something that has been with me for like maybe like 3 to 4 years already and especially maybe you guys have heard of Glenkin uh he's one of the uh, to me he's one of the best animators in the world he started his career in in Disney so he worked in Aladdin Beauty and the Beast you know Tarzan all of those kind of movies and i had the opportunity to work with Glen uh like a year and a half ago little mermaid as well yeah exactly so you guys know who i'm talking about and glen's vision of animation is exactly that you know making sure that the characters feel authentic and alive and real so you, you know this is a very complex uh kind of concept to understand maybe at first but the more animation you do the more you understand and what i'm going to show you guys here is exactly that and i'm going to try to portray that emotion and that character into a bouncing ball understanding one of one of the things that i didn't learn uh when i was a junior animator was the uh, motivations of the characters right so in this small session we're going to do we're going to try to understand that because i think that's the difference between making sure that your characters feel alive and real and authentic uh, and not just moving them because you have to move them around right there's nothing worse in an animation tv show or movie than seeing a character that doesn't feel real or authentic right or that uh, their movements are coming from 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 the inside right So this is hopefully what what I'm going to try to explain and and show you guys in in this like small demo. Uh so but but yeah that's basically the uh, the uh the duty of an, an an animator making sure it feels real and authentic. Right? What inspired you to like you know get into it? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that um you know when I was a, when I was a kid I always liked to draw right i always like drawing stuff but then later in life when i was in my teen years i felt that drawing maybe was not my thing 
And then somehow I said, I want to make robots. So that's what I want to do for the rest of my life, right? In my head, creating something from scratch, you know, even like, let's say like, you know, grab pieces of metal and then putting them together and making sure they moved or they, you know, kind of performed or, you know, like creating a little bit of life. Uh, that's something that was in my mind in my, in my uh, early teens. So I think that's where everything comes from. I'm not exactly sure, like a specific moment in my life that made me want to be an animator. Yeah. Uh, cause I know, I know a lot of people that said, yeah, I, I know that I wanted to be an animator, like since when I was a kid, when I was like five years old, but that's not my case. Right. I discovered this, um, you, cause you know, I had this maybe dumb idea when I was a kid that cartoons were made by themselves. Like there were, were no people involved. They were just there, you know, in the TV and that's it. You know, <laughs> they just exist. <laughs> but then I learned that someone has to make them. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, it's it's kind of like quite a bit of story when you said like you want the machines to move and everything uh, when you talked about it I'm thinking about transformers maybe like you know somebody yeah. picked up your brain and you know they made transformers so it's kind of yeah cool. that's yeah. a great example yeah yeah so in my head it was something like that you know just creating robots and I was a hundred percent sure that I wanted to to study something related to that to making robots or uh, you know creating life and then, and then later in life, again, like maybe two, three years later, um, I said, you know, why not combining my drawing skills uh, or my, not skills because I didn't have any skills back uh, in that moment, but then maybe combining that passion about drawing and, you know, mixing it with something else, which is like making robots or, you know, creating stuff out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And this is when I started considering animation as, as a career. So I felt I could mix both. Uh, in such a cool way and when I was a teenager as well I took like a like a course on acting and you know I was part of the drama club um, for for a short season so then I started developing like a very how can I say this like I started liking acting too Uh, I discovered that part in my in my life so I said I wanna I don't want to be an actor I don't want to be like a live action actor uh, because I you know I don't feel that I can you know perform in front of a camera and like you know but then maybe I can I can perform through my characters yeah. I can do what I want to do through them right and making sure that you know they feel alive and real and you know making them move and seeing them move is like one of the best feelings ever when I learn how to do how to properly animate a bouncing ball, which is like the basic stuff, like the most basic stuff you can learn. Um, I was so happy and so mesmerized by the result that I could really make it look authentic and real and just not moving. Uh, so, so then it was like, yes, this is my, this is this is what I'm going to do, like forever. Um, so it's pretty basic, right? Because um, yeah. maybe maybe if you're not an animator um, or someone who's not into art in general, maybe it's like, yeah, it's just a bouncing ball. But, you know, all the knowledge behind that and all the stuff that you have to make sure uh, you put in the right places, uh, you know, that's something that still amazes me, how we can communicate uh, an emotion or a feeling through, you know, putting a frame in a specific position in the screen and it works. It's like magic sometimes. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, that's that's what you know. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to learn me. this. So let's uh, get into ja- bouncing ball then. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. All right. So w- what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna go because my approach to animation, even though I'm not a 2D animator, and I'm a 3D animator, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to explain as best as I can the uh, the 2D basics behind a bouncing ball. Okay, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys have um, heard of. Oops, sorry. Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys have heard of timing and spacing, right? Uh, this is like one of the most basic principles. These these two are the most basic principles of animation, and what they are are basically, it's like a very nice couple, right? one of them cannot exist without the other. It's like the perfect, I feel that the perfect mixture between timing and spacing can make an animation beautiful or it can make it look totally wrong. So 
when we master timing and spacing, I think we have like maybe like 80% of the job done. And understanding these basic principles is what's going to make the difference between, you know, making sure that the, whatever we're animating feels real. And again, like I said, authentic. So I'm going to draw here a little bit. So basically, these, these are the two, um, just choose a color here. These are the two things that we're going to learn. Timing, timing plus uh, spacing. All right, and basically timing, it's the amount of time. in which an action, whatever action, happens, right? So let's say one frame, 10 frames, 15 frames, 32 frames, you know, whatever. And for film, uh, and, some, and sometimes even for TV shows, the, uh, the default frame rate or the default timing that we're going to use is 24 frames per second. I don't know how you guys are, if you guys are familiar with these concepts, like 24 frames per second. Is, uh, is, is this something I need to? No, no, no. I know 24 per second, but like you can explain it like maybe like in a really short way, like, you know, really Okay, yeah, way. for sure. Yeah. So basically every second of animation that you guys see on the screen, like TV, film, whatever, uh, consists of 24 different drawings. That's it, right? You have to make sure to draw in this case, 24 pictures to make sure that one second of film can happen. Uh, right? So that's it. That's, that's pretty much it. Because, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's creating the illusion of movement through static pictures. So basically 24 frames per second um, says that, yeah, every 24 frames will be one second of our movie. Right? So, so that's what I'm talking about, timing. And then spacing is the amount amount of motion between between frames okay that basically means the ball or whatever object we're talking about is going to move from here to here or can you see my camera as well or no, we just want to see, oh. uh, see your okay uh, yeah. it's fine so we're going to we're going to discuss this if the ball is going to move from point A to point B or to point C or maybe here to point D, right? So that's the amount of movement that's going to be in every single frame, okay? So now that, that I have explained this, let me do the actual demo explaining why this is very important, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this animation here. Uh, I'm going to do a basic ball bouncing, right? And I'm going to explain to you why this is important to know. So I'm just going to put a floor right here just to make sure that it's, it's right there. And then we're going to make it bounce, right? So the ball will start here, okay? So that's our frame one, as you can see, or zero, frame zero here in Krita, frame zero here. And then let's say it's going to take, um, let's say, uh, seven frames or eight frames here or here to come down so i'm going to put a frame here and then on frame seven see i'm here on frame seven the ball is going to be here right so these are my two poses here this one and this one you can see both right so that means that i have one two three four five six i have six frames right, where the ball has to travel, like if I draw like a line here, I'm going to show you. So I have to choose really carefully where to put these six frames, right, so maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, right, so I'm going to divide that line into six different sections to make sure that I'm putting the ball in those exact places, and you'll see what happens when I do that, right. I'm going to undo that because I don't want to see the lines. So here's what I'm going to do. Okay, one here. 
the next here the next here 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 and here see I put six balls in between there so I'm gonna play the animation so you guys can see how it looks and here it goes so here's the important thing right is the ball moving does it feel like it's moving yes it totally feels that it's moving from the top of the page to the bottom of the page right but the thing is that it doesn't feel quite right right it feels just like it's moving just because you know because I put the six drawings in between the my first two poses so the timing is correct because the ball should fall a, a normal ball let's say like a soccer ball should like fall in about seven to eight frames but the 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 spacing is wrong do you remember that I created this line and just separated like this so the spacing between the drawings is very even right they are separated exactly the same way so when we do this in animation this feels completely robotic or static or fake okay and we don't want that we don't want an even timing we don't want the you know you can you can see right how they are you know very even one from the other so like I said in order to communicate that this ball exists in real life or you know in the animation world we have to make sure that our spacing this is when the the other concept of spacing plays a really 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 important role if we want to make sure uh, to animate a ball properly we have to understand that there are a lot of physics right behind the uh, this object falling the first one is gravity right the other one is drag the other one is air resistance and I think those are the three ones that we're gonna consider for this one so here I'm gonna make like a quick um, uh, annotation here if you guys wanna learn to properly animate stuff you have to learn not to animate just a ball falling but you have to uh, uh, to learn how to animate physics right you have to learn how to animate the um, these are also called the motivations you have to understand why you have to always ask why is the character or the object moving? What makes it move? What makes it travel from this pose to this pose? And then only when you learn this, when you understand all this physics behind something falling, then this is when you can start playing with your spacing to sell the idea that the ball is falling and not just traveling in a very linear path okay so this is what I'm gonna do next I'm gonna I'm gonna create a better spacing chart this is how we call them these lines are called uh, spacing charts charts so I'm gonna do a better one uh, to make sure that I consider these elements in the equation right so I'm gonna just hide this layer for now and then I'll do it again, but the proper way, okay? So first frame is going to be here, right? So then I'm going to put, oh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, first frame is going to be here. And then the uh, last frame is going to be here. So you can see that the first frame and the last frames are exactly the same as before but then I'm gonna do a better job trying to make sure that the in-betweens work better so the first one is gonna be really 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 close to the ball it's gonna be like this what I'm gonna try to do is something more like this right and this is saying something right when we see a lot of frames together right pretty tight together this means that the object is going to accelerate 
from that position, right? So the closer they are, um, the uh, less amount of movement they are going to have. And the more separated they are, as in here, so here and here, this means that it's, this movement is going to read faster to our, to our eyes, right? So if we understand that um, an object falling is gaining uh, force, right, is gaining force, this chart right here is exactly what's, uh, what's going to make sure that the gaining force shows in the, uh, in the falling of the, oh, in the fall of the ball, right? So let's do it so you can see better what I'm saying. Just remove this. And then we're going to do it in, in 3D later, so you can, you can see how these principles are exactly the same. It doesn't matter if you do 2D or 3D. It's exactly the same. So, all right, let's do it. So let's go to frame uh, 2 and then put it here. Oops, sorry, I think I changed the color a bit. So, right there, then the next frame, it's going to be a little bit more separated than that. Then the next one, a little bit more. Then a little bit more. And then finally this one is going to be a little bit more separated. So, take a look. Uh, take a look at what happens now that I play the animation. See, now it feels heavy. Now it feels a little bit more real. Now it feels that it has weight. So this is something that still amazes me, how controlling that spacing results in something more real or more authentic or something that we're used to seeing in the real world. So, as you can see, if I turn on all my, my drawings, you can see how they are pretty tight in here, and they are more separated in here. Okay, and that's just going to, that's exactly what's going to cause. It's going to cause uh, the, the uh, feeling, the uh, sensation that this thing has weight and that it exists in, let's say, in the real world or in the animation world. Uh, so this is why these two principles are really important to make sure that you guys understand them uh, because this is going to make the difference in every single way, right? And, you know, the, the, the more you learn about animation, you're going to learn some other tricks to make sure that your animation looks nice. Um, but this is, this is exactly the principle that we're going to use for everything right uh, making sure that whenever we design our spacing charts right we got to make sure that we are controlling these uh, in-betweens these are called the in-betweens in animation because controlling them will uh, is going to make the animation look exactly the way we want them right to to look uh, so this is the the, uh, the principles behind like the 2d principles so I don't know if you guys want me to you just go to the 3D version and I can show you exactly how that works in, in 3D. Yeah, let's uh, jump into uh, 3D, uh, yeah. but actually like, you know, before you jump in, this is a mm -hmm. like pretty cool concept because like I know animation, but like deep down, I didn't know anything about like diving and spacing. Uh, today it makes a lot of sense because I learned physics, you know, back in school and engineering, but like I know there is gravity, but like we are like, like creating gravity through spacing that was pretty epic exactly exactly that's something that when i when when you learn this as an animator is like i said it's just like magic uh controlling the spacing in which the uh, ball you know is presented on screen that's going to make a huge difference on how the audience is reading that ball right and then this is how we can control the weight of the ball and you know, this is a very basic principle, but not this not only works for, you know, for balls or for whatever. It, this works for, f you know, fully animated characters. Yeah. These principles also apply 
to the face, to the eyes, to the arms, to the fingers, to everything. Everything that we do in animation is completely um, ruled by these principles, right? So we cannot escape them. They are the uh, like the golden rule to follow if we want to make sure that our animation looks oh, looks nice. good. Okay. Uh, right? Before we okay, cool, cool. All right. So I'm going to do exactly the same. All right. I'm going to position this uh, ball here on the ground, right there on frame one. Uh, then I'm going to do a full cycle, okay? Then on frame, let's say, I don't know, frame 12, I'm just going to put it here, right there. And then I'm going to go and make the cycle work in, let's say, 24 frames. So 24 frames later, the uh, ball is going to be back in the same position, right? So now, of course, because this is Maya and we have, like, let's call them free in-betweens, I'm just uh, do exactly the same as before. Uh, so for this, we basically only need, uh, you know, three poses, and Maya is going to take care of the rest. But then we still got have to make sure to control the spacing somehow. Those in betweens, as you already know, are really really important. If I don't do that, and I just play this animation just as it is, it will look exactly the same as the uh, 2D version, the first 2D version that I made. All right, and I'm going to show you why. Whenever we select, and I'm going to turn on the uh, in-betweens so you guys can see. Just give me a second right here because I need to load the uh, plugin pretty fast. Okay, so here you go. Watch. So if you see all the in-betweens here, just go back there. You can see how they are pretty even, right? See, whenever I move the ball, you can you can see pretty easily how they are spaced exactly the same way. As you guys can see, everything here is really even. You know, you can see all the drawings in between represented by these colors, the red ones and the green ones. And you can see the spacing between all of these is exactly the same. So again, as you already know, uh, playing this animation will result in something really, uh, you know, linear, boring, and it's just the ball moving and not having any consideration of the weight or the physics or the uh, gravity. So we have to fix this, right? And, you know, there's a pretty cool tool in Maya called the Graph uh, Editor. So I'm going to bring that up right here where we can control how these uh, in-betweens are going to be shown. So I'm not going to get too technical with this because I think learning a tool like this will, you know, it takes a little bit of, you know, practice and a little bit more time than just like 15 or 20 minutes. So I'm just going to, you know, do it here uh, to show you guys how controlling these in-betweens, this, this green line basically represents all the in-betweens. So instead of the line being too linear, I'm making sure that I'm saying Maya to hold the frames, you know, in the top part of the arc for longer, and then making sure that when the ball is coming down, uh, they accelerate, right? And they are more separated between, between each other. So if I do this, uh, just move this out of the way, then you will immediately notice a big difference. See, now it feels that the, uh, let me just turn off the, uh, the in-between so you can see. Now you can feel that the uh, ball is actually moving and, you know, bouncing in, in a proper way, in a really cool way. Right now it feels real. It feels heavy. It feels, you know, you can feel the uh, resistance. You can feel the ball uh, decelerating at the top of the arc and then accelerating as, you know, as it's coming down. Um, so this is basically the same principles that I applied in the 2D drawings and because, you know, that's what it is. It's drawings. It's just the ball represented in space, uh, in a different place in space for every single frame. You know, it's, it's moving, right? And then, you know, this is like the basic uh, bouncing ball, but then we can 
try and add another principle, which is called the uh, squash and stretch, to make sure that it feels more more organic and maybe a little bit more cartoony and nice. And I'm going to show you guys how to do that. Um, so here, watch. We have these controllers here in this specific rig that will make the ball, you know, do this kind of stuff, which is really cool. It feels really organic and, you know, fleshy. And again, you have to understand when and where to use this. And most importantly, you have to understand why you are using these controllers. You don't want to add any squash and stretch if you don't understand why it should be there. Because again, this is just going to make your animation look weird. So, you know, let's put a little bit of thought process here so you can understand why I'm putting these, uh, these frames where I'm putting them. So if we understand that the ball has force, has energy, and it's coming up and down, we want to make sure that when the ball contacts the floor, we want to make sure that all that energy reads, you know, as a squash because all the energy is coming down. So the energy has to dissipate somehow, and that's going to affect the ball in the contact positions. So frame 24 is the contact. So I'm just going to squash the ball right there. Okay, and because this is a loop, I'm going to copy the same squash to frame one because that's exactly the same pose, right? But then you'll see the ball cannot be squashed for the whole time, right? Because it feels, you know, like weird. It doesn't make sense that the ball is squashed all the way through. So after the squash, the energy, again, you have to understand what's happening, right? So you have to understand that the energy has to be released somehow to make sure that the ball bounces back up again. So in order to do that, in frame two, we have to make sure that the ball is really, really, really stretched, something like this, right? It's just one frame of a difference, but this, you know, is going to make the ball look really, really squashy and really fluid and really organic. And then here's the other thing. We have to understand that that energy has to dissipate through time. So it won't make sense that the energy dissipates like for this long, you know. You, you can see how the ball is coming back to its default position at the top of the arc. I feel that that energy has to go somewhere before, before reaching the top of the arc, right? So maybe around frame 7, this controller has to be uh, zeroed out just to make sure that the ball comes back to its original shape okay right original shape and then I want to preserve that original shape here maybe until frame 17 so I'm going to add another pose here which is gonna make sure that the ball holds its shape from frame 7 until frame 17 and then again you have to understand that when the ball is coming down, it's going to gain momentum and energy. So all that energy is going to drag the shape of the ball like this, right? So in frame 23, the ball is going to have uh, its longest shape, right? Because all that energy is traveling through the ball, and then all the air resistance and all the drag is pushing this part of the ball upwards, making it, you know, look like, like this. Hey, uh, and then frame two. Uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. There's a question from uh, Kim. Sure, uh, sure, sure. How do you know uh, how much to squash stretch per frame? Oh, that's a great question. This is something that you learn from observation, right? So what I'm doing here is something a little bit more exaggerated because this doesn't happen in real life. Like you would never see a um, a basketball, you know, bouncing. Uh, I mean, uh, deforming as much as I'm doing it here. You can be more uh, conservative in the, you know, in the amount of squash and stretch. I'm doing this just to show you how the principle applies. Uh, but, you know, and this is a great question because the squashiness and the stretchiness of an object is defined by the material of the object, right? So maybe a golf ball wouldn't deform as much or a ping pong ball wouldn't deform maybe at all you know, when it's contacting the ground. Uh, but maybe a beach ball, you know, will be more squishy and will have more, you know, of that, you know, kind of 
rubbery feel, organic feel. So this is, you know, not a regular ball that I'm doing here because I'm exaggerating the concept here just to make sure that it, you know, uh, it's understandable. Uh, but that's a great question. And the short answer is it depends on the material and the physical properties of the, of the ball. All right. Or, or even, you know, how cartoony you want it to look. So let's say in movies like Hotel Transylvania, you know, um, animators use a lot of these. I didn't work on Hotel. I was at Sony before, uh, but I saw a lot of my fellow animators, you know, using this principle like, you know, all over the top because that's the style of the, of the movie. Uh, so when you see the ball in, in motion, see, it looks like, like this. It feels, you know, a little bit more squishy, a little bit more cartoony, a little bit more exaggerated. And if you guys want to see the in-betweens, let me show you. Uh, they look, I think they look fantastic if you see them, you know, playing next to each other. See? One of the one of the cool principles of animation that you guys have to learn how to apply is this very cool concept called shape change. So, and, and this, is the, this is very interesting because human eyes like to see contrast in movement, right? And not only in movement, in general in art, let's say in music, in paintings, in photography, you know, in any kind of art, humans, we like contrast. Um, so let's say in music, uh, if, you know, everyone, I think everyone here likes music, right? And they have, you guys have your favorite music. If your favorite piece of music had no contrast, it would be so boring, you know, it would be so lame that, you know, it was, would be like, ah, you know, this, this doesn't have like any flavor. Music has a lot of contrast and a lot of texture with different instruments and voices and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, Paintings also, you know, they require a good painting has like a good source of light, which creates contrast. It has like good color theory behind, which also creates contrast. And then in animation, it's exactly the same way. Good animation needs contrast in timing, you know, the amount of, I mean, the, the, the time that it takes to move the object from one place to the other. And it also need, needs contrast in the shape, you know, the shape change, how it, you know, squashes, stretches, how it moves. So that's going to make it just, you know, interesting and not flat and, and boring. It's, I think it's one of the hardest things to master when you guys are learning or studying animation, making sure that, it, that it's interesting and that, you know, it's entertaining for the audience is one of the hardest things ever because you've got to make sure that pretty much every single frame has, you know, some richness to it. Um, and you can see that here. If I if I pause in you know any frame here, you can see how, you know, you can see how the green shapes are getting squashed, and then you can see a very nice contrast in one frame. That's like a boom. That's like a, you know, like a nice, like a nice. How can I say that? Like a nice, you know, spicy thing, right? In the in the contact pose, right? And it's not only that. That you know, the most important thing is that it feels real. It feels that the ball is reacting to the environment. So again, that's what you want to do. Your main goal, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of object or character you guys are animating. The main goal should always be to make it feel authentic and real. And you, you know, you get, a, you have to convince the audience that whatever is on the screen is real, you know, and has feelings or has weight or has mass or has, you know, physics affecting the, uh, the, the character. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a quite a great concept. You know, I learned a lot of stuff about animation today than uh, when I went to school. Uh, I'm just being honest here. Uh, hey, Han, so do you have a, like a character you can show? So here you, you can see it, right? This is a shot. I'm going to play it once and then we can just talk about it. I'm going to mute it because it doesn't matter. The sound doesn't matter. So. Right, so this was for the for the Adams family, the first movie. Um, we are working on the second one now, and as you can see, these characters are bouncing balls, right? So, you know, this is a, the perfect example because these are bouncing balls, and it's super easy to, you know, to think about them as bouncing balls and not as heads, because it just makes the uh, the the work really, really, really easy and less complicated than thinking of 
the full head as you know as a whole so you know if we see the character on the right here this one let me just um yeah you can see the character on the right right here this one the this like chubby guy on the right so you can see how i apply these principles of you know squashing the head you know when when he lands and then he has to build up that energy to make sure that he can jump uh so here this is the force represented through the whole head in the in this cool squat uh, stretch pose you can see how the eyes are stretched as well the nose is longer and narrower and the mouth as well you can see the nice contrast between this mouth see how this mouth is so wide at this moment and then a few frames later boom super stretched and long hey on i have and a question just, um uh, yeah for sure interrupt you so no worries when you did the you know characters when he was like you know bouncing from the ground so mm -hmm. as he stretches so it's a basic movement right so you have only a controller for the rig at the top where you can squash a stretch exactly so my question is so you focus on the primary animation first like the stretch and the squash then you focus on the facial expression and stuff like that or how do you like usually like you know go for it yes that's exactly how i did it i focus on the uh on the main perform on the main rhythm first mm -hmm. and then i do all the facial pass later because the most important thing first was to sell the idea that these characters are part of a how do you call this like when there's four people singing a quartet i don't know if that's a word in english mm -hmm. um but you know they are they had to be in sync and the directors wanted them to feel like they were jumping not all of them at the same time but like let's say the first guy and the third guy were jumping at the same time and then the second guy and the fourth guy were jumping at the same time in like an opposite kind of movement so yes this was a little bit of um i had to plan this shot for like a long time before making sure that it was reading properly uh, because the rhythm in this shot was really, really something that I had to make sure it was, I, I'm not going to say perfect, but, you know, pretty pretty consistent and pretty entertaining. And because they are jumping for, let's say, how many frames? 256 frames. So I had to make sure to make them as entertaining and as less boring as possible. Because if you see four bouncing balls bouncing for like 12 seconds in the same place or in the same way, that's going to get boring really fast. Like after three jumps, you're like, okay, you know, get me out of this shot. I don't want to see it anymore. Uh, so planning is a really important thing. Yeah, I can so, see the contrast, like the way you play the contrast in animation. So that explains the concept pretty good in this animation. And uh, one more question is like, sure. once you started like doing this animation, did you get like a storyboard or something? Or they say like, you know, you do, you know, whatever you can, then we will just, you know, give notes on it. Like, how does it work? Yeah, this, this was pretty, uh, pretty specific challenge one, challenging one, because uh, I, okay, so here's the story about this shot. Someone else had this shot before me. And for whatever reason, I think I think this person had more shots to finish, so she couldn't even start the shot. So I got this shot casted like as an emergency. Like you have to make sure that this works fast, right? Um, we didn't have any storyboards for this. Uh, we didn't have any personalities for this because these heads only appear like once or twice in the movie, and that's it. So they were not like main characters or anything like that. But still, I had to make sure that each one of them was like a had a specific like voice and yeah. timing and that kind of stuff. So this is pretty much all my thought process with the help of my lead and my supervisor because mm -hmm. you know there was nothing. So all the ideas that I put here, like the rollings, you know, you know when they roll, yeah, when these guys roll, like like this, you'll see here, you know, and you know all of this is just you know this came from from my head mm. um we didn't have anything anything to follow except for yeah. the song so it's going to be a follow-up question from this question so mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing this animation do you have to sync with the like the voice or the music behind that too so mm -hmm. yeah oh, okay. yeah for sure 
Let me let me see. I, I I'm not sure you you guys will be able to hear this. No, right? You can't no, hear no, that. No, we can hear. Because I'm not I'm not streaming the audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I have to I have to sync it. I have to make sure that you know their their jumps are synced to the song as well. Okay, so so what's the timeline for this? Like I know, like they said, it's uh, like it's emergency, but um, it's like. I know it's an emergency, like in a normal day at studio, like how long would they give you? Like what would be the bid time for it? So this would this would be something maybe for like maybe three weeks, three weeks of work. Three weeks? Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, but I had to do it in two. So it's not like a huge difference, but I mean, yeah, five days is like a, a lot if you are speaking in animation terms. Mm -hmm. Five days is like actually you know like great extra five days to make sure that everything works uh so yeah this was done in two weeks and you know the, and this is the interesting thing even though they're just let's say simple stuff like bouncing balls there's so many things involved in all the facial performance and all the the shapes that i was telling you guys if you if you if you had a chance to see the rigs like the basic you know setup of the rig like the the design of the characters uh, they were like really, really ugly. Not, I'm not gonna say ugly because of the design, but you know, because of the rig, you know, they are like in their default T pose, so they look not, you know, to, they don't look as appealing as in here. Yeah. So one of the other tasks was to make sure that you know they looked appealing, and let's say I had to design, you know, all the mouth shapes, for instance, when they're uh, like this, this guy to the left, right? These like um mouth shape with with these like lines yeah. in here and that you know it's like like design work as well that's what i'm trying to say oh, or okay. the so, eyes okay did they give character. any blend shapes to you so no no oh, blend okay. shapes so oh, everything okay. is like like animator oh, nice animator yeah Damn. so that sounds like a lot of work man anyway like yeah. i think uh, i'm seeing like questions popping up like Wenki, can you read the questions of course ah uh, so uh, he already answered like one of a question from uh, Kim that is like how much specific uh, directions do you get from uh, animating a scene? That I guess you already answered that question. And OJ is like how long did it take to animate the scene? Yeah. Okay, animate was it just you? Yeah. Okay. Two, yeah. Yeah, asked, two weeks? Just me. Two weeks, uh, yeah, I asked the question too. Okay, you also mm -hmm. made up all um, the facial expressions. Yeah, I did. I did. So that's that's exactly one of the you know the other interesting things about maybe maybe having this shot to be an emergency shot. They just said, okay, do do whatever you want. We don't want to waste you know your time. So make sure that just it's as you know as entertaining as possible. And yes, I I chose like a very specific like shapes and expressions for each of them. So let's say this guy on the left. You can see. Uh, can you can you see my camera? I don't know if you can see my camera, no. but let me just. Okay, let me just stop presenting for a quick second. Uh, can you see my face now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the guy on the left, yeah. uh, I decided to make him look like like this, you know? Like, yeah. And then the guy on the right, on the most right part of the screen, he's pretty much all the shot with his eyes like he's like the cool guy because he's like the bass because he's doing like the pom 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 kind of i know you can't hear the uh the audio in the animation but you know in my head he was one of these like guys that's just like boom 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 so i tried to make sure that the faces because we don't have shoulders we don't have uh, a neck that yeah. can you know do this Ooh, we don't have yeah. that yeah so one of the you know the the other challenge of this specific piece was to make sure that you know to portray some kind of character mm -hmm. in just a, in just a sphere which is really hard because you know we as humans have a lot of parts to express you know we have shoulders we have necks we have you know things like this to put yeah. our hands here 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 i don't know and then not having anything of that is like very like limited so yeah. i had to make sure that the face was you know as 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 good as possible yeah it does show in your work yeah. for sure Hey Juan, uh, there's a yep. question from Kim. Uh, do you separate uh, working on the physics and the facial expressions? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the uh, the question. You no, know, I like... think what she was trying to say is like the question I asked you before, right? So the first post was like you were doing gravity when mm -hmm. you were like bouncing. Oh, true, true, true. Okay, yes, yes. So like I said, I just made sure to 
plan first the uh, the overall rhythm and texture of everything, mm -hmm. and the faces were just like flat, not singing, not blinking, nothing, mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure that everything was working. Because when you work in in a shot like this, uh, you have to make sure that it's going to be clear, and the main you know the main movement you you have to work like you have to work smart you have to work from the you know start big you know in big chunks and then go into the details because if you start with the details you know it's just a waste of time because the details might be lost once you decide to do a big jump or whatever so work on the big picture first and then work on the details and then in this case even though the face is really important the, the overall rhythm of them jumping around is the most important thing, and then the face. Yeah. It was oh, nicely thanks. explained, Jan. Uh, I really recommend, uh, I really appreciate that answer. So it applies in all kind of art, whatever it is. We always focus on the primary first, mm -hmm. then secondary, then tertiary. So that's how it works. It works on art, music, you know, sculpting, you know, we can take anything. And I think we also have another question too. I assume all assets, textures, rigs were provided by to you, but what about lighting? Did you have freedom with lighting and camera and frame? That's great. No, I don't have any influence on assets or textures or you know, uh, and I mean because we're working in the in the full movie, in the whole movie. So the only thing I get are the rigs, and that's it. I don't have any input on anything else just the animation so lighting compositing all the textures and all of that is just other people uh yeah how about camera it's, framing it's okay. does it come from layout or you guys have to do it by yourself oh that's a great question as well um in some cases the uh let's say when i was working in tv shows sometimes animators do the layout as well because of time and you know budget constraints so sometimes it's like our job to create the camera and everything but normally in a feature film uh, there is a layout department and they are the ones who put everything together and you know they put the uh, scene the shot like just for you and then they put the camera they put the audio they put everything to make sure that you just open it and animate it and then there's like an extra step after animation which is called final layout so that person will take the shot back and make any small adjustments so let's say the layout artist didn't consider the height of the jumpings too much so if I decided to make them a little bit higher you know uh, that would mean that the heads would have been cut right yeah. so I have the freedom to move the camera back and then the layout artist would go back to the shot and adjust like you know make a small slight adjustment like you know maybe tilt up a little bit or you know that like power so I'm gonna l I have to let you go now so <laughs> I really worries. appreciate sure. I, I really appreciate it and uh, before you leaving I just really want to thank you for coming to the stream and uh, explaining you know about basics of animation I learned a lot of stuff uh, I never knew about uh, you know, timing and spacing ever in animation before, so that explained everything. And it also so inspiring as well, and thanks for joining us, and hopefully I'll see you in the future. For sure, no worries, and I mean, thank you for opening this space for people. I think this is a great, you know, it's a great um, initiative to, you know, just open up spaces for people to share stuff. I think that's great, and, and no, my pleasure. Thank you for, for having me, and thank you everyone for, for asking questions. Thank, thank you, Anna. It, uh, it's truly uh, inspiring, whatever you said. Even like, uh, I'm, I'm a compositor. Like, I, I used to do some, uh, like, a animation thing. Sometimes, like, uh, they don't want to go to uh, uh, 3D stuff, so they'll just stick with uh, the 2D images. So they asked mm -hmm. me to animating uh, in, in a new case. Uh, mm -hmm. So whatever I'll do, like, I'll, I'll just do it, like... Thank you.